Here we have read tonight one of the most solemn and striking events in Israel's long and lengthy history. The departing of the glory of God from the nation, really for the first time. They had never experienced judgment or chastisement like this before. The fact that the glory had departed was symbolized in the reality that the ark of God had been taken by the Philistines. And the fact that the glory of God had departed was marked by the naming of Eli's grandson, Ichabod. And the word Ichabod literally means no glory, or the glory has gone. And as long as Ichabod would live, his name would be a testimony to the children of Israel of their apostasy from God and God's displeasure upon them. And we have to remind ourselves as well that the Apostle Paul tells us that whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning. I don't think anything really worse can happen to a nation or to a denomination or to an individual church assembly or to an individual believer as experiencing the glory or the blessing of God or the presence of God or the favor of God departing. And I often wonder, has Ichabod been written over Ulster? This island in which we live, especially this province in the north where God has so blessed his word and blessed his people and blessed his church down through the years. And then we look at the situation that we find ourselves in tonight. I often wonder, has Ichabod been written over this nation? Has the glory departed? Many churches have Ichabod written over the door. Many churches that once preached the gospel and once seen a great work done for God in many respects and in many different assemblies, Ichabod could be written over the door. And I'm thinking as well about not just churches that we would class as being liberal or apostate, but even churches that would be orthodox in many respects. Oftentimes, the question has to be asked, has the glory departed? Churches who, like Israel, once knew great deliverance and God's blessing. It has to be said that I don't believe that Ichabod is written immediately over a church overnight or over a people or over a nation overnight. This thing does not just happen all of a sudden, but I, I believe that there's a building up and there's ultimately a straw that breaks the camel's back. And God gives warning and God gives notice and God raises up men and faithful servants of his and God oftentimes sends chastisements and judgments in time to cause his people perhaps to realize that the divine displeasure of God is over a nation or over a people. I think this is proved very clearly from the book of Ezekiel that we have studied already in great depth over the years. In Ezekiel chapter 8 and verse number 4, uh, we have read about uh, terrible things happening within the temple, abominations in Jerusalem. And the amazing thing is that even while there was so much sin in the city of Jerusalem, we're told in Ezekiel 8 verse number 4, the glory of the God of Israel was there. God was still there. In spite of all of their sin, in spite of all that was going on, God's glory was still there because God is long-suffering and God is gracious and God is slow to anger. But whenever you read on into chapter 9 and verse number 3, it says, The glory of the God of Israel was gone up from the cherub where he was to the threshold of the house. So the glory of God had, had risen and was beginning to somehow move and was now at the, the threshold of the house. And then you read on into the next chapter, chapter 10 and verse 4, the glory of the Lord went up from the cherub and stood over the threshold of the house. And the house was filled with the cloud and the court was full of the brightness of the Lord's glory. So slowly but surely this Shekinah, the sense of God's presence and glory is, is moving. You get to verse 18 of chapter 10 of Ezekiel. The glory of the Lord departed from off the threshold of the house and stood over 
the cherubim. And then chapter 11, verses 22 and 23, tells us the glory of the Lord went up from the midst of the city and stood upon the mountain which is on the east side of the city. And it's like slowly but surely, God is being driven out by the sins of his people. Because God and sin cannot live together and dwell together in harmony. God either cleanses sin or God either chastises sin. And it's my conviction that the greatest chastisement that that God can give is the removal of his blessing, glory, and conscious presence. All that we consider there briefly in Ezekiel indicates that the stage, piece by piece, gets set for a period of time. And then ultimately Ichabod is written over the nation. And I think the same is true in 1 Samuel. Ichabod was written over the nation of Israel. But for years before that event happened and that child was born and the glory departed, I believe that the stage was being set for a a long period of time. And quite simply our subject tonight is setting the stage for Ichabod. What is it that caused Ichabod to be written over Israel? And what is it that could cause Ichabod to be written over Ireland or over Ulster? What is it that could cause Ichabod to be written over a church or over the life of a believer? How can we set the stage for Ichabod? I just want you to notice a few simple, simple things. If you look there at verse 2 of 1 Samuel chapter 4, we have there an unexpected slaughter. Israel were in battle against the Philistines. It was really uh, the Philistines had come down and they had sought to attack Israel and the enemies of God will always seek to attack the church of God and the people of God. And I believe that as long as God's people are right with God, there's every opportunity and every sense that God will bless. But on this occasion, it says Israel was smitten before the Philistines and they slew off the arm in the field, about 4,000 men. Israel, in a sense, were like Samson. Whenever Samson got his hair cut and realized that the Philistines were coming upon him, he said, I will arise and go out as at other times. And I think the Israelites here were the same. The Philistines were coming in and they says, we will arise and we'll go out. It'll just be like other times and God will give us the victory again. But he didn't. God didn't give them the victory. 4,000 men lost their lives that day and there was an unexpected slaughter. The question has to be asked, why? What were the factors? Why was it? That victory was gone. Why is it that they were no longer able to fight, as it were, the fight of faith? Why is it that they were suddenly defeated whenever God had given them victory after victory, generation after generation? Well, I believe there are three reasons why there was this unexpected slaughter. I believe that Israel had become an unholy people. They had become an unholy people. Now, the calling of God and the nation of Israel was... Ye shall be holy, for I am holy. We read that in Leviticus 20 and verse 7. And the same thing holds good for the church, because Peter quoted that verse, and speaking to New Testament Christians, New Testament believers, he he, he told us that it's God's will for us to be holy. And there was a sense in which the Israelite people legally before God were a holy people. They were separated unto the Lord, but they weren't living that out. This holy people had become an unholy people. And they were coming out of the era of the judges. Now the book of Judges ends with that heart-searching verse of Scripture. Judges 21, 25. In those days there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. It was a day where secularism was on the rise. Yes, the church was still there. Yes, God's people were still there. Yes, the tabernacle was still there and the priesthood was still there. and They were still making offerings and sacrifices. But the people, by and large, had become an unholy people. And I believe Israel, at this juncture in their existence, was just like Ulster is tonight. 
They have become secular. There is no longer any sense or acknowledgement of divine authority in the nation. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. No absolutes. If it feels right, do it. If it appeals to the flesh, do it. If it appeals to the eyes, do it. They despised authority. And folks, tonight, people are talking about it. There's been an acceleration, I believe, of antagonism against the gospel and against the authority of God's word in this nation. People hate the gospel. They hate the word of God. They mightn't say that, but they do. Everything that the Word of God stands for, it seems that society is against. And there's been letters in our papers recently, or Brother Norman gave me a cutout of a letter that was in the paper, and amazing that papers would print some of the things that they print. People blaspheming the God of heaven, calling God all of these terrible things and saying that the God of the Bible is cruel and evil and wicked and immoral, And men like Richard Dawkins, that's the standard of morality. And this is what's being printed in our our local papers. And really that's the consensus of opinion. What sort of God would damn the souls of unbelievers? What sort of God despises adultery? What sort of God would allow pain and suffering? What sort of God would allow a nation to struggle financially? What sort of God would despise homosexuality and all of these things that are so prevalent in our society? What sort of God would despise an alliance of wicked, ungodly men in government allowing themselves uh, and getting into authority? Why would God hate that? After all, this has brought a sense of peace and And we're told that if God despises those things, well, the Bible can't possibly be right. And and generally speaking, the children of Israel here, whenever they were going about their duties and they were setting themselves in array against the Philistines, they never consulted Samuel. Not that Samuel in and of himself was anything special, and he would have acknowledged that, I'm sure, as well. But Samuel was a prophet to the nation. Samuel was God's voice to this people. Samuel, if you like, was the Bible of that day and generation. Yes, they had the books of Moses, and then Samuel came along as a prophetic voice speaking on behalf of God, and they despised Samuel. They didn't want to listen to what Samuel had to say, just like our society today has cast off the word of God. Now, Israel had a, as a nation had been blessed. And God promised them, them that honor me, I will honor. Just in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 30. But they hadn't honored God. They were just going through the motions, paying lip service. And scripture says that righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. So they had become an unholy people. And then perhaps even worse than that, there was also in force at that day an ungodly priesthood. You turn back to chapter 1 of 1 Samuel and verse number 3. It speaks of Hannah, godly woman. She was going up to the temple of the Lord to pray in Shiloh along with his, or her husband. And it says concerning Hannah and his, her husband Elkanah, this man, in verse 3 of 1 Samuel chapter 1, this man went up out of the city yearly to worship and to sacrifice unto the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, listen, the priests of the Lord were there. They were the spiritual leaders of the nation. They were the men that were interceding and going into the, the tabernacle and into the holy place and interceding for the nation and offering prayer and offering sacrifices and wearing priestly robes and priestly vesture and and priestly garments. But we read on in chapter 2 and uh, verse 12 down to verse number 17. It says in verse 12, Now the sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were sons of Belial, children of the devil. They knew not the Lord. They were unconverted men, ungodly men. And they had got into the ministry, as you, if you like. They had got into the priesthood. And whenever they were offering sacrifices, they would throw in a flesh hook into the seething pot. 
And instead of offering God the very best, they would keep the best for themselves And they would fill themselves on the meat that was to be offered for sacrifice. And they would save the best cuts for themselves. And they would eat to the point of excess. And they were gluttons and they did not take their ministry seriously. They were ungodly men. And it tells us in verse 22 of chapter uh, number 2 of of 1 Samuel that they also lay with the woman that assembled at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. So there was fornication and sexual immorality. And it wasn't hidden from view. It was was open and people could could see exactly what was going on. And these were the spiritual leaders of the nation. And the scripture tells us that in the last days, Blind leaders of the blind will rise and it talks about men whose gods are their bellies. And it talks about false prophets and false teachers. And it talks about all of these things in the last days. And folks, even men that are orthodox and that maybe wouldn't practice sin as openly this, it's a very easy thing to be in, in the work of God and even in the ministry and go along to presbytery and go along to services on the Sunday And not really take our calling seriously. I'm told that there's men and they freely admit that they download their sermons. And they pay £10 a month and they go onto the internet and they get their sermons for the year. And they maybe change a point or two here and there. And they just preach them and pass it off as their own. And and there's manipulation sometimes whenever things are are happening. and, And things are taken very lightly. Even whenever men fall into sin, the Bible says fools make a mock at sin, but it's often laughed at and it becomes a joke even amongst amongst the priests of the Lord whenever things are going on that aren't right. And it's almost laughed at as if it's just a laughing matter. These were unconverted men, children of wrath. Somebody once said, Satan is no longer fighting the church. He's joining the church. And then something else that I believe set the stage for this unexpected slaughter. You had an unholy people, an ungodly priesthood, but you also had in Eli an unfaithful parent. Eli was undoubtedly a saved man, a a man, yes, of God. And there was a time, I believe, in Eli's life whenever he was spiritually sensitive and he was spiritually switched on and he... He, he prayed for people and he tried to execute his ministry faithfully. After all, he accused Hannah of being drunk. He didn't maybe have the best discernment in the world, but he certainly didn't think at one time in his life that drunkenness was the right thing in God's house. But whenever his own children, Hophni and Phineas, got involved in this immorality and gluttony and they were ungodly men, sons of Belial, we, we sort of read there that that Eli asked them in verse 23 of chapter number 2, why do you do such things? There was no real rebuke as these boys were growing up. And I suppose just to keep his own conscience clear, he just challenged them very lightly about what they were doing. Instead of kicking the bums out as he should have, he just went and said to them, why do you do that? Just a gentle kind of question. And there was no rebuke about the sin that was going on. There was no discipline. He was perhaps scared of offending them. The scripture says that his eyes were dim by reason of of years. And yes, that's speaking physically, but I believe spiritually as well. Over the years, Eli's eyes had grown dim. And he could in a sense see what was happening, but maybe couldn't see just how serious it was because it was in his, his own family. And there was perhaps a lack of discernment. No desire to discipline open and, and blatant sin amongst the people of God. And Eli would have known that this was holding back the, the blessing of God. And folks, I believe that homes tonight are under attack. It's almost now frowned upon if parents discipline their children. Discipline has been taken out of so many areas of society. We no longer hear about punishment. We hear about rehabilitation. 
And very often the case is that if a parent would even talk about the rod or anything like that of, of correction, they would, they would be frowned upon. And that filters as well into the, into the church. Oftentimes, sins that are so, so open and, and sins that are there and, and everybody knows, if folks, if it's not dealt with and if it's not repented of and if it's not confessed, we're setting the stage for Ichabod. It says in chapter 3 and verse number 1, the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli. And the word of the Lord was precious in those days. There was no open vision. That word precious there means rare, scarce. The word of the Lord was a scarce thing in those days. And that's why God was raising up Samuel to be a prophetic voice to the nation. Because the word of God was a rare thing. It was a hard thing to, to, to go to Israel at that time and hear a real word from the Lord, something that God has burdened upon the heart of a, a faithful priest or a faithful prophet or a, a faithful seer. And folks, in our land tonight, the word of God is becoming a more rare and more precious thing. I remember whenever I was in my teens, late teens, early 20s, there was so many places you could have gone to and missions that were on. If you wanted to hear the gospel preached, you could have literally any night of the week, you'd have, you could have gone somewhere 20 years ago, 15 years ago. But where would you go tonight? You want to go to a, a Bible study tomorrow night or Thursday night in, in cool rain and, and hear some man coming with a word from the Lord and preaching out of a King James Bible and, and bringing a, a word from heaven to your soul? Would it be easy to find a place like that? We had this unexpected slaughter and I believe it was a reality because of an unholy people and ungodly priesthood and an unfaithful parents in the nation. And then there was an unfounded solution. Israel had lost 4,000 men according to chapter 2 of, or, ch or verse 2 of chapter number 4. It was evident that something was wrong. And so they decided, we'll get together and we'll sort this out and we'll find a solution. And in verse number 3, you have this foolish questioning. When the people were coming to the camp, the elders of Israel said, Wherefore hath the Lord smitten us today before the Philistines? Why did this happen? And they don't look at themselves, and they don't look at the state of the nation, and they don't look at the, the lives of the people, and they don't think about how they're living before God. No one seemed to know why they had been humiliated before the enemy in such a fashion. They didn't think to question themselves. Instead, they pleaded ignorance. They pleaded ignorance. And very often, whenever a person loses out with God and backslides, very often they'll ask all the questions, how did this happen to me? And very often the last person the backslider is honest with is themselves. If you read the book of Malachi, you'll discover that there's, I think, about eight times whenever God brings a charge against the people. And every time God charges them of something, they say, how, how, do, you, how do you come to that conclusion? Will a man rob God? Well, how have we robbed God? And so on and so forth. And they never questioned themselves. And so it was here with these elders in Israel. They didn't question themselves. In reality, they began to, to question God. Why did God allow this? We're God's people. God has an obligation to bless us and give us victory. And God has given us promises. And we're a, a covenant people. And the Philistines are godless, ungodly men. And surely God should have given us the victory. Why did this happen? And really, I think they're questioning God. But God, folks, has no obligation to bless us. Especially whenever there's sin in the camp. You think of the carnality and the disunity. And the infighting in homes and in families and churches and the prayerlessness and the things that are tolerated tonight that are questionable, if not downright wicked, that years ago would have been frowned upon and put out. And we still ask, God, why, why are we in such a state? Do we really need to ask the question? Is it not a foolish questioning? And they sort of didn't have any sense of need to seek after God. A foolish questioning. Then there was a false confidence. They got their heads together. They asked this question, why have we been defeated? What's happened? 
And then they concluded in verse 3, Let us fetch the ark of the covenant of the Lord out of Shiloh unto us, that when, listen, it cometh among us, it may save us out of the hand of the enemies. Now, what was the ark of the covenant? It was a wooden box, coated inside and outside with gold. Inside was Aaron's rod that budded, the golden pot of manna, and the two tables of the law, and it was covered by a golden mercy seat that was often sprinkled with blood, And whenever it was in the holiest of all, that was the dwelling place of God. But really, without God resting upon it, all it was was a box. All it was was a relic. All it was was a material piece of furniture. It was a symbol. It had no intrinsic power of itself. And they were putting their confidence, this false confidence, in a box. In the ark, rather than the God of the ark that says, we'll bring it and it will save us. How foolish they really were. And many today put confidence in outward forms, in relics. We see, I suppose, people running to different places in the south of Ireland and they go to uh, the, these shrines in different places and they go to Crook Patrick and we see it in the, in the continent as well in the Church of Rome and they're so superstitious but even in fundamentalist evangelical circles we can have this idea that if outward forms are right and things are right outwardly God will bless and God will give victory and God will give deliverance if we have the right version of the Bible if we dress the right way if all the women have head coverings if we're fundamentalists and if we're five point Calvinists and all those things are good. I agree with all those things. But folks, those are not going to save us. God might bless those things, but just because we carry the authorized version, just because we're a separated people, just because we view ourselves as not being in the apostasy, just because we generally dress up on Sundays and come to church and we're clean and we look the part and we sing nice hymns and we talk about the blood and all these things, those are important. But those things won't save us. We can't put God in a box. As the Israelites did. We'll get this box into the camp and God will be inside the box and that, that's going to work. And sometimes we think, well, if we do this, that, and the other, we'll box God in and we'll keep God in and we'll get God to, to give us the victory. And then the tragic thing was, look at who was carrying the ark. In verse number 4. The two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were with the Ark of the Covenant of God. Fat use, fat use those two boys would be to you. Hophni and Phinehas. Fornicators, idolaters. Idol- You'd have been better having Mickey Mouse and the Michelin Man carrying the Ark. The Bible talks about the iniquity of holy things. And you see how the whole thing now had become a farce. And they weren't even aware of what had happened. And then in verse 5, there was not just a foolish questioning and a false confidence, but a frenzied commotion. When the ark of the Lord came into the camp, all Israel shouted with a great shout. And they sang and they danced and they praised and they worshipped and they were everybody's there and they've got what they want now and they've got their heads together and there's unity. They're not fighting amongst themselves. This is great. And we've got the ark. And doesn't it look so well? And we've got the priests. And we're going down here to the Philistines. And we're going to press the battle to the gates. And we're going to. And there was this whole frenzied commotion. Everybody was excited. Everybody was encouraged. Everybody was optimistic. God's with us now. This is great. We've got a new lease of life. But folks, God still wasn't with them. Because the thing that God promises to bless in his word is obedience. And you can have everything going for us, but if there's not an obedient heart, God has no obligation to bless. Insensitive hearts become fertile breeding grounds for false confidence and religious hysteria. Now, I'm not really in the game of hammer and other churches and all the rest of it but you look at the churches in our country and you, you look at the churches in this town that are big and the money's going in and people are getting excited and they're dun- jumping about and you think of this place down the road the vineyard here and there's thousands I'm told that go to it 
and it's big emphasis on worship. But there's no call whenever a person becomes a Christian, in inverted commas, to repent of their sin. You can still have your drink, you can still have your drugs, you can still sleep around outside of marriage, you can still live with your girlfriend. And yet there's people I have spoken to in that whole system that came from free Presbyterian churches, that came from gospel halls, that came from Baptist backgrounds, that know what a Christian ought to be. But see, whenever you have an insensitive heart to the Spirit of God, that insensitive heart becomes a breeding ground for religious hysteria. And where you get a big crowd of people and everybody gets excited, the thinking is, as it was here in Israel, God has to be in this. Has to be. This couldn't possibly happen. We couldn't have a big building and we couldn't have all this crowd of people and we couldn't have a praise band at the front and everybody excited and all of these things happening unless God was in it. Is that, is that the teaching of the Bible? That the blessing of God is measured by, by numbers and by excitement? Because, folks, there's religions, and you go to the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem. We were there on holidays one time. I'll tell you, there's a lot of excitement down there. You go to some of the Mecca and all of these places, Morocco, whenever the Muslims go on their pilgrimage, there's a lot of excitement. Is God in it? You know, a few years ago, in this land, 90 or 2009, there was a whole lot of excitement about celebrating the 50, 1859 revival, 150 years since this great move of the Spirit. And don't get me wrong, I think it's right to remember things like that, but books were put out, and special meetings were held, and all of those things have their place, don't get me wrong. But I remember thinking, I wonder whenever it comes to 2010, will there still be this burden for revival? Will people still be holding meetings about revival? Will they still be talking about revival and praying for revival and preaching about revival? Or is it just because it's a nice round figure? And folks, looking back, you know what I, I think most of it was just nostalgia. But nice to have that again, wouldn't it? Oh, God didn't do it. And we'll move on to something else. And it's just a frenzied commotion. And you wonder sometimes, is God really in it? And then you've got not just an unexpected slaughter, an unfounded solution, but the story ends with an unthinkable situation. The stage is virtually set for the birth of Ichabod. Things were about to get worse. You look at verse number 6 down to verse number 9, you have a destroyed force, the Philistines, from a, view, from a vantage point, from a, a far off place, they heard the shout of the Israelites in the camp. They, they, they heard the, the music and they heard the, the shout going up and they saw the excitement and they came to the conclusion God must have visited them and will have to go down and, and take them unawares. And that's what they did. And they went down and they slew this time 30,000 Israelites. Seven and a half times as many as before. And you see, folks, what's happened here? Israel have trusted in the wrong things. And they haven't searched their hearts. And then whenever the battle intensifies, they're still not prepared and the whole thing gets even worse. You know, even the world nowadays is, is talking about the secularization of society and we are told that we're living, and I suppose there's a lot of truth in it, that we're living in a post-church society. And uh, they'll, they'll say about the, the, the main churches and the main denominations that fall under the umbrella of Christianity, and I'm talking about Christianity very loosely, and they'll talk about how the numbers are going down, and that's true, it's happening. Generally speaking, the numbers are going down, and multitudes are leaving the churches, and the churches are trying everything to kickstart something that is, they're trying everything apart from God. I met a Presbyterian minister a few years ago in Korean in a, one of the charity shops, and he had just moved up here a few years ago, and he used to be in a church that some of our family went to, and he had buried quite a number of people in our family. And he, he said something I, I thought was very interesting. He says, I don't know about your church or your denomination. He knows that I'm a free Presbyterian. He says, but I'll tell you something about ours. 
Every time ministers get together and elders get together, all they do is talk about what program they can try next. And it's all a big think tank. And he says there doesn't seem to be any getting before God. He says it's just all getting together. And we've heard about this works here and this works somewhere else. And maybe it'll work for us and we'll get together. And they have this course and this course and this program and this qualification. And ministers getting qualified and qualified and doing degrees. And people getting sent off for courses and getting together and bringing things in. And he says there doesn't seem to be any real seeking after the Lord. And the sad thing is that in 2 Samuel chapter 5, or chapter 6, sorry, in verse number 5, we read about a fellow called Uzzah who touched the ark of God. And God smote him down. And that sounds, I used to read that and think, boy, that's hard to accept. But did you ever think about why the ark fell? God had called the Israelite people to carry the ark Priests, faithful priests that were consecrated unto God, were to lift up the ark of God using two big poles or staves that went down the side of the ark through rings and lifted upon their shoulders and carry it, and it had to be a burden to them. But they got tired carrying it, and so they, they designed a little cart. And they put the ark inside the cart, and they got a couple of oxen to, to trail the cart along, and, and this was so much easier than having a burden than having the weight of the thing upon your shoulders, than, 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 than putting yourself out. Just get, the, just get the animals to do it. And we'll put it in a cart. And then one of the oxen stumbled, and that's when the ark shook. And that's when Uzzah, an unconsecrated man, who was not to touch the ark, touched the ark and God smote him down. But before that happened, same thing that happened here. They were singing and they were dancing and they were all around this new cart. And they thought it was the best thing since sliced bread. Why didn't we think of this before? This We've been trailing this thing through the wilderness for years. And we should have thought about this cart earlier. But it wasn't God's way, was it? Folks, new carts lead to death. You know, I think if Noah was, was in Northern Ireland tonight and he was building his ark and he was standing preaching outside it, you know what people would be saying to him? They'd say, Noah, you're standing there and you're preaching and you're talking about God, and you're talking about sin, and you're talking about righteousness, and you're talking about judgment. Nobody's coming into your ark, Noah. But Noah, you know what you should do? See, see whenever all these animals, you get them in, you, you should open up the ark and let everybody come in and see the animals. There's wee boys and girls there, and they'd love to see what a tiger looks like, or a lion, or a giraffe, or a hippopotamus. And you could open up the ark and get them in, and let them feed the animals, and maybe have some dinner for them. And, get them, and then once you get the men, close the door and hopefully the rain will come then and they'll all be saved. But folks, that wasn't God's way. God's way was faithfulness, obedience and preach the gospel, preach the word. And if nobody listens, that's... No, you've been faithful. And then there was a devastated family, not just a destroyed force, but a devastated family. Verse 11 says, the ark of God was taken. The two sons of Eli, Hophni, and Phinehas were slain. God had told little Samuel, whenever he was just a little boy, that ultimately this would happen in chapter 2 and verse 34. And then we read that a messenger, a man from Benjamin, came out of the army. He escaped, and he came to Eli, and Eli heard all of the wailing going up. And Eli sent for him and says, what's happened in the battlefield? And the young man begins to tell him. He says in verse 16, he says, I fled out of the army. Verse 17, he says, Israel has fled before the Philistines. Eli's listening. And there hath been a great slaughter among the people. And Eli's listening. And thy two sons also, Hophni and Phinehas, are dead. And Eli's listening. And the ark of God is taken. And it says in verse 18, whenever he made mention of the ark of God, that was the thing that broke Eli's heart. He knew that judgment was coming in the nation, I think, in his heart. He knew that his children, his two sons, were going to be cut off. But it was whenever he heard about the ark of God. And then in verse 20, Phineas' wife, she died as well. She heard about it. Labor pains come on early. She went into an early labor, having heard of all that's happened. And you see how this family, Eli, the two sons, one of the daughters-in-law, died in a moment of time. 
And it was all because of sin, rebellion, disobedience, idolatry amongst the Israels, Israelites. All of those things destroyed this family. And friends, in the last moments of this woman's life, and she was probably the most spiritually sensitive in that whole family circle, this young mother, this young woman, in the last moments of her life, all she could think about, the glory has departed. And I believe the last word she uttered as the midwives came and took that little child out of her arms, tried to comfort her, she just handed the little boy over and said, Ichabod. And she lay back in her bed and she went into eternity. And that speaks of a departed favor, a devastated force, a destroyed family, a departed favor. You know, this is the first time in the history of Israel that they didn't have the Ark of the Covenant in their midst. It was the first time in the history of Israel that the Ark of the Covenant had fallen into enemy hands. Now that, that Ark symbolized, symbolized the presence of God amongst his people. That's what it symbolized. And now it's gone. And the presence of God and the glory of God has gone with it. And her dying words, Ichabod. You know, God's glory dwells amongst his people. Paul said concerning these bodies of ours, we carry this treasure in earthen vessels. Your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you. And then whenever God's people dwell together, the Savior says, I am there in the midst. And the church of Jesus Christ is that which is supposed to display the glory of God to the nations. But are we conscious of his glory? Samson, wist not that the Lord's glory, the Lord's blessing, the Lord's presence and anointing had left his life. For years he'd been setting the stage for Ichabod in his own life. And then that day came. And the tragic thing was he didn't even know it until it was too late. Now, folks, tonight, I don't mean in any way, shape, or form to be an, a pessimist. And I know tonight we all, I believe, love the Lord in this, this, this hall tonight, this room tonight. But it's either Emmanuel, God is with us, or Ichabod, the glory has departed. Now, as we come in and out of church and in and out of meetings and go about it, are we conscious of God's glory as we meet together or have we lost something and we need to pray return O holy dove return sweet messenger of rest I hate the sin that made thee mourn and drove thee from my breast